are here and ready. Uh, my name is Ellie Letterhandler. Uh, I'm very honored and pleased to uh, open and to chair uh, this session over here in Jerusalem. It's evening. I understand some of you are uh, in places uh, uh, elsewhere in the world. So whatever time of day it happens to be, uh, hello and welcome. Um, as you all know, uh, we are here to launch uh, an important uh, publishing event, important uh, for various reasons. Uh, the publication by Oxford University Press of the first full-length uh, English translation, unabridged translation of a work that has been in circulation in various versions in various languages uh, since the uh, 50s. Um, the Journey into the Land of the Zex and Back uh, by Julius Margolin. And uh, as you all know, it has been uh, superbly translated and also annotated uh, by Stephanie Hoffman, who will be taking part uh, in the panel uh, in a few moments. Uh, let me introduce the entire panel to you. Uh, and then we will um, uh, begin without further ado. Um, the first to speak, uh, and I trust that uh, the audio and everything else is working now, uh, Deborah Capel is a research scholar and lecturer, recently named a Behrman Fellow at Princeton University, where she teaches in the Department of Sociology. And she has published, among other writings, a book called Gulag Boss, a Soviet memoir. Um, in terms of uh, things that are uh, directly relevant to uh, the material with, that we'll be uh, talking about uh, this evening. Um, Stephanie Hoffman, whom I have already mentioned and many of you uh, already know, um, is uh, a former director of the Mayrock Center for Russian, Eurasian, and East European Research at the Hebrew University. She's edited and translated extensively. Um, she has done a marvelous and sensitive job um, on the text of uh, Margolin's uh, book. And we will be hearing from her uh, uh, after uh, we hear from uh, Professor Capel. Uh, and third up on uh, the panel to round out the discussion um, is uh, Professor Leona Toker, Professor Emerita of uh, Literature in the English Department at the Hebrew University. She's written extensively on a number of things, but in particular uh, reference to tonight, she's written uh, uh, a book uh, called Return from the Archipelago, narratives of Gulag survivors, and most recently, uh, Gulag literature and the literature of Nazi camps and intercontextual, uh, an intercontextual inter reading. Sorry about my uh, slip of the tongue, intercontextual reading. Um, so I won't uh, waste uh, uh, further time with the preliminaries. Uh, I only want to say that um, the book itself, if you have not yet had a chance to read it, uh, is a must read. It's a, uh, move, moving is not, is not uh, a sufficient or indeed um, at all um, uh, accurate way to describe uh, the experience uh, of reading this book. As uh, Dr. Margolin himself writes towards the end of the book, it is not properly speaking a memoir uh, because it is too goal oriented. It's too specific uh, in its intentions uh, to the reader. Um, but uh, it uncovers to all of us, even those of us who are familiarized already uh, with uh, what has been written from and about uh, those who passed through the Gulag system in the uh, Soviet Union. Uh, it has revealed much uh, from the point of view 
of uh, someone who could keenly observe each and every uh, moment and each and every um, uh, permutation of a life in a different sort of existence. Um, so we will be hearing about this uh, from our panelists. At the very end, I understand that uh, Dr. Margolin's son, Ephraim, is with us uh, this evening. And uh, if he would like a few words uh, to add uh, and comments and remarks uh, after we've heard from our panelists, uh, that would be most welcome. Uh, so let me ask uh, uh, Deborah Capel to uh, open our discussion, please. And if again, the rest of you make sure that you're on mute. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Eli. Um, and thank you all for coming to this. It's fantastic how many people are here. Um, so when I was handed the manuscript for Gulag Boss um, in Moscow, it was for, I was interviewing Russians for another project actually. And one came back to me and said, I have this manuscript, I'll never get it published, et cetera. So I took it home with me. I put it on a shelf for a few years because I was not a gulag specialist. And then I took it off the shelf and I read it and translated it. But the reason I'm bringing that all up is it's a very interesting look into the life of a gulag boss, but I didn't have access to the Margolin book in those days. And if I had, I would have somehow amended what I wrote about it because there's so much in there about the bosses, so much clear, information about how they picked on the prisoners, how they mistreated them, how they organized them in, in, in angry, terrible ways. And um, I think that's a, that would be a criticism of my own book that I translated and annotated. Um, at Princeton University, I taught a freshman seminar for eight years called Stalin's Gulag. Uh, once I translated that manuscript and got into this literature, um, and it was always my most oversubscribed class at Princeton in all my years there. It was fabulously interesting to um, young people and they don't know about it. Americans in particular know very little about this. Um, so then I got very interested in the literature and very familiar with it. So I was very happy to be able to look at and read this book and comment on it for the press. Um, and in it, I remember saying that this is the best written book about the Gulag and literally about that whole time period of the Gulag. And what's really amazing about it is how he, in such great detail and with such beautiful writing, talks about the various populations of the, in the towns where he lives. So you learn so much about life under occupation in Poland and Belarus. And um, there goes my, my, my microscope. <laughs> uh, so I appreciated that. And, and talks in there really blatantly about why people didn't leave. When they knew that something was coming, they didn't leave. They were just thinking that it would be okay somehow, that they would be able to keep themselves safe. So I think that part is, is another piece that makes this book a very valuable um, one to have been translated and published. His writing, he's a writer and an observer, and you, you grow to be very fond of him as a narrator because he's an honest guy and he's looking around and saying, this isn't right, this isn't, what is this? And explains everything as he learns and understands in every, in every situation. The, probably from my, to my mind, the most profound chapter in this is the one called dehumanization. What actually takes place to, in the Gulag. I, I, I just think everybody should probably start with that chapter. <laughs> it's not a long chapter. I wish I had it when I was teaching the Gulag class because I, as just this American white girl, cannot actually describe what it was like to be in a Gulag camp, but he gives it to you there. It's, it's unbelievable. I mean, I use the Grossman reading in my book, if you're familiar with that one, uh, Everything Flows, Siltachot. Um, that's pretty good, but this would be better. 
So once if I teach that Gulag class again, and I kind of look forward to that, I will use this book. The last thing I'll say is, um, um, I didn't. I, I didn't know. I just want to say this and, and ask somebody to address it. I didn't know that he had written it so long ago, and that Solzhenitsyn was influenced by it. And I don't know why I did. I had never heard of Margolin or his book before this. So anyway, I look forward to everybody else's comments. And if you have questions, please, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. I think we'll we'll actually wait for uh, the end to see if there mm -hmm. is time for questions. Uh, I hope there will be. Um, Stephanie, you're next, please. Okay. Am I, you hear me now? Speak up. Yeah. Okay. Um, first, I want to thank the Nevsland Center for arranging this evening. I also want to thank a few people who are extremely helpful to me in my work on this book. The initiative of both Misha Shaouli and Leona Toker helped the project get underway. And they also checked the translation as I proceeded. I can't thank them enough. My special thanks to Susan Ferber, senior editor at Oxford University Press. She immediately perceived the unique qualities of Margolin's work and carefully supervised every stage of the way to producing a superb edition. I would also like to thank my husband, Alan, for his editorial help all along the way. I first read an abridged version of Margolin's journey to the land of the Zex in the mid 1970s for a project on a number of Soviet gulag memoirs. <clears throat> I was deeply impressed by it at the time and considered it the most powerful of all the works that I read. <clears throat> Reading the entire narrative many years later reinforced that impression. It is a classic. Consequently, I felt it was a privilege to be able to bring it to the attention of English leaders. Reader, excuse me. Today, first, I want to talk about the reasons why the book is a classic that everyone should read and why it is an uplifting rather than a depressing narrative. As Julius Margolin himself was a very special personality, it is worth noting those aspects of his biography that shaped his development as a writer, philosopher, and humanist. Margolin's torturous journey to the land of the Zex began with the Nazi invasion of Poland on September 1st, 1939. With a penetrating eye, Margolin succinctly captures the utter confusion of a country caught with its defenses down and the total desperation of Jews like himself and other refugees who try to escape disaster. No doubt these pages will resonate with anyone who has read about today's refugees trying to escape modern disaster areas. Margolin already points to the utter deceptiveness of the Soviet world. The Poles initially welcomed the Red Army, which invaded Poland on September 17th, thinking it had come to help Poland against the Nazis. This misconception quickly faded as the Soviets instituted their harsh rule with its repression of political, cultural, and civil rights deportation of so-called undesirable elements and central economic control. In, in the midst of the turmoil, one sees more talent for pinpointing the absurd and ironic in the situation. Unable to escape, he lands a job sorting through thousands of books, some incredibly rare, that have been dumped into a former Catholic monastery. He is supposed to separate them according to their suitability for a Soviet reader or the bibliographic value. When he enters the room, he exclaims, quote, I felt as if I were in King Solomon's cave full of diamonds. Never in my life had I held a position that more suited my inclinations, end quote. This charmed period ends when he sees his own book on Zionism consigned to destruction. One of the strengths of Margolin's narrative is that he relates events as they are unfolding, making the reader a partner in his bewilderment and agony of the moment. 
Yet he breaks this rule very effectively in the Polish section as he describes some similarly trapped fellow Jews with their talents and their flaws. He then poignantly relates how each later met his death, either at the hands of the Nazis or by Soviet repressions. The heart of the book begins with Margolin's arrest in June 1940 because he refused to accept Soviet citizenship. His philosophical acuity is evident already in the chapter entitled The Wandering Coffin which describes his journey to the Gulag in Dantean terms. Quote, in the darkness of the wandering coffin, it seemed to me that we were moving downward, continually downward, underground, away from the world of the living. Our train was not moving in an ordinary human dimension. We had departed from human memory, from history, end quote. Margolin's survival in camp depended to some extent on good luck, but his education and personality enabled him to perceive and comprehend his ordeal in the broadest way, and his literary skill enabled him to narrate it artistically. The power of the book lies in Margolin's ability both to explore universal truths and in parallel, in short chapters, to encapsulate these truths through small, intimate moments. Thus, there is a searing but general chapter, Dehumanization, which Deborah mentioned, which step-by-step step chronicles the degeneration from a normal being to a ragged scarecrow whose ties with family and friends are disrupted, pride in his or her abilities is destroyed, who loses sexual desire, and finally, even the ability to suffer and is reduced to a fearful, obedient beast. Margolin illustrates this with a personal example. After numerous instances, when a powerful bullying figure steals his meager possessions, Margolin stuns the man by showering him with blows. The other men in the barracks are proud of him, but he is ashamed. Quote, on that day, I underwent another stage of dehumanization. I did something that was against my very essence. I shall never forgive the camp or its grim creators. All my life, my memory retains that blow to the face, which for me, for one short minute, made me their accomplice, follower, and pupil." End quote. In another chapter called Man Horsepower, Margolin sketches the inefficient but also dehumanizing nature of work in labor camps, which, quote, treated the horse and the cart driver in camp as equal in worth, melding them into the body of the centaur, into one concept, man horsepower, end quote. On occasion, prisoners were forced to perform work usually assigned to horses. In one case, Margolin had to turn the huge wheel of a machine that cut twigs for forage. He remarks bitterly, the forage cutter worked on horsepower, but there was no horse. Instead of a horse, they utilized a rider seized beyond the border of the Soviet Union on the territory of another state and forced into slavery by the right of the victor as a socially dangerous element. Although unrelenting dehumanization is the camp rule, Margolin describes inspiring examples where people defend their freedom of choice as human beings. In some instances, people are motivated by religious conviction, such as the so-called Christian martyrs who refuse to work on Sundays and holidays. In others, real or feigned insanity, such as the young Jew Met who refuses to work and praises, the, praises Hitler and the Germans for giving sausages to workers. He frightens the camp authorities and they back away from him. We also see uplifting examples where human kindness is not extinguished. Margolin relates how when he was working with a young woman at a potting shack, she discovers that he has no bread and calmly gives him half of her bread, one of the most precious commodities in camp. He's so moved that his lips tremble. He writes, I knew that Agronskaya was an excellent person. And because I knew moreover, that she was the most ordinary, commonplace person. 
I again believe in humankind and in the concealed meaning of its existence. The doctors who, cured, who cared for Margolin in camp when he had reached the bottom rung provide additional examples of individuals who still retain their humanity. Worth noting is Margolin's universalist concerns, which are based on respect for the nationalist aspiration of the various peoples he meets in camp. In the later manuscript entitled Key to My Biography, Margolin wrote about himself, quote, Margolin's nationalism is only the consequence, only the logical conclusion from the much more general principle of universal freedom, end quote. A touching example in the book is the story of Mikola, serving time for alleged Ukrainian nationalism, whom Margolin befriends when he hears Mikola whispering lines from the Iliad in Greek. Praising Mykola's kindness to him and his refined grasp of poetry in general, Margolin states that he was the first to teach him appreciation for Ukrainian culture. Noting the difficult aspects in the history of Jewish-Ukrainian relations, Margolin wishes for the day when Ukrainians and Jews can meet in friendship as free peoples. Margolin's universalist approach deep morality, love of freedom, and defense of individual rights, as friends noted, were typical characteristics of the traditional Russian intelligentsia. It takes, however, a very special person to retain these traits and a faith in ultimate justice after an agonizing journey to the subterranean kingdom, as Margolin called it. I would like to mention those aspects of his life that helped him shape this exceptionally perceptive and, and humane individual. Julius Yuli Margolin was born in 1900 in Pinsk, now part of Belarus, but then in the Pale of Settlement, the area where Jews were permitted to live in the Russian Empire. Around the time of Margolin's birth, the population of Pinsk was over 70% Jewish and his Jewishness was an integral part of his identity. His early education instilled in him a love for Russian culture and the Russian language. This feeling did not leave him even as he endured the torturous conditions of the Soviet labor camp. For example, a poignant chapter in the journey called Ivan Alexandrovich Kuznetsov tells about his friendship with an imprisoned village pedagogue. Sharing a love for Russian literature and bibliophilic zeal, the two spent their rare free time in the camp discussing these and a wide range of topics. Unfortunately, the, the starvation camp conditions drove a wedge into this friendship, but, but that's another story. Some of the poetry that Margolin wrote in the camps was published in a posthumous collection entitled From a, Nor From a Northern Country. The next important stage in his intellectual development was his studies at the University of Berlin, Berlin where he received his doctorate in philosophy in 1929. No, no. His analytic philosophical approach permeates the journey and enabled him to place his own suffering in a broader perspective, as for example, in the chapter uh, Dehumanization. His powerful intellect comes through also in his ability to write three philosophical treatises in camp, the theory of falsehood, the doctrine of hate, and the doctrine of freedom. In the course of his imprisonment, they were all destroyed by camp officials, but he managed to reconstruct the doctrine of hate, which is a chapter in the book. Other aspects of his Berlin years are worth mentioning. He met and married a fellow philosophy student, Eva Spector, whose kindness and hospitality is mentioned by all those who knew her and whose devotion sustained him even during the years when they were unable to be in contact. At that time, he wrote occasionally for a Russian language journal, Nakanunya, the organ of the change of landmarks movement, which envisaged, which envisaged the possibility of reaching a rapprochement with the Soviet Union. This suggests that like many intellectuals of his time, he found a certain appeal in socialist doctrine and had very little knowledge about the reality of the new Soviet state. 
The Berlin cultural scene also played an important role in the development of Margolin's personality. Many prominent members of the Russian and Russian Jewish intelligentsia were living there in the 1920s when Margolin was pursuing his degree. Some remained in exile, such as Vladimir Kodosevich and Nina Beberova, whereas others, such as the writers Ilya Ehrenberg, Marina Tsvetaeva, and Andrei Bieli, later returned to the Soviet Union. Recalling this period in view of a memoir by the writer Vadim Andreev entitled Return to Life in 1969, Margolin remarks that for him, a provincial from uh, Pins in encountering Europe for the first time, the Berlin period was rather an entry into life rather than departure. He recalls that he participated in a group of young poets called Four Plus One and was present at a reading by the prominent Soviet poet Vladimir Mayakovsky. His deep love of Russian and other literature and the humanities in general helped sustain him mentally in camp and remained throughout his life. In Israel, in an article in 1969, he wrote, quote, I am happy that during my life, I was able to read not only the Bible in the original, but also Pushkin and Tolstoy, and most recently also Bulgakov, and Margarita and Solzhenitsyn's books. On occasion, his literary erudition, uh, he, he utilizes his literary edition ironically in the journey. In comparing his Soviet imprisonment to that described by Dostoevsky in Return from the House of the Dead, he describes the prison in Tsarist Russia as practically a country club. In another place, he refers sarcastically and grimly to Gorky's play, The Lower Depths. Quote, those people about whom Gorky wrote were so in love with themselves and so full of their own singularity and picturesqueness. Here in the camp, only unbounded humiliation and demoralization prevailed, end quote. An amusing and sad echo of his Berlin years is found in the chapter, Letter to Ilya Ehrenberg. He composes a letter to Ehrenberg, recalling, quote, those times when we met in the Berlin House of Culture, unquote, and inquiring whether Ehrenberg can send him some books. Margolin's sole purpose in writing the hopeless letter was to get the officious woman in charge of supplies to relate to him as a human being rather than as a cipher an attempt, naturally, that fails, as she is fearful of anything outside of the usual camp routine. After completing his doctorate, Margolin moved with his wife and young son to the city of Łódź, then and now part of Poland. The significant aspect of those years was his meeting with Zev Vladimir Lutinsky and becoming an adherent of his Zionist Beitar movement which led to the decision to move to British Mandate Palestine in 1936. In order to obtain the money for the British residence permit, Margolin took a loan from a relative, agreeing to repay it by managing his factory in Woods for three years. Unfortunately, two days before he was supposed to return to his family in Palestine, the Nazis invaded Poland, signaling the start of World War II and Margolin's journey. The very fact that Margolin survived his ordeal and returned to his family, thanks to an international agreement that allowed Polish citizens to return to Poland, gives the book a positive ending. The final section of the book, The Return to the West, contextualizes Margolin's work in a larger framework than that of simply a gulag story. In two short chapters, covering his stay in, in Woods while arranging his documents, he masterfully juxtaposes his own return to the world of the living and his horror at the destruction of the Jewish world in Poland that he had left. On, on the one hand, enchanted by the grace and vitality of the young Polish women, his deadened natural urges revive and he describes a brief affair with the young woman. 
On the other hand, he is horrified by the absence, the green grass on the wasteland where once the city's monumental Gothic synagogue had stood. In his mind, the pre-war city teeming with Jewish workers and merchants and his own friends is superimposed on the current rebuilt central city teeming with new life. He thus vows to be true to the memory of the shadow kingdom, even as he himself rebuilds his life. Margolin's return to the world of the intellect is a rough road. In Marseille, while waiting for a ship to Palestine, he reads Sartre's nausea and being a nothingness. Though he has been schooled in the theoretical philosophy of Heidegger and Husserl, he is repelled by Sartre's ex existentialism, exclaiming, quote, there was a subterranean link between the mental attitude and the climate of this book and the future successes of Hitlerism or of Stalinism. The philosophy whose starting point was La Nose, physical disgust at life, inevitably led to its logical result, moral and political indifference and politically capitulation to its opposite. Rejecting negativity in favor of alterity, finding fulfillment in others, he exclaims, quote, I wanted to live. I had just escaped from the abyss and I was seeking allies, friends, companions in the struggle with real evil. Even the joyful steamship journey to his family in Palestine had its bleak side. A prominent figure in the pre-state journalistic world warns him that no one will want to hear his story in the socialist-oriented pro-Soviet Jewish issue. They will believe that he is slandering the Soviet state. Indeed, upon his return to Tel Aviv, Margolin could not find a publisher for his story. Partial French, German, and Russian publications took time in coming, and the full English translation is available only now. The same will to survive and insistence on upholding his ideals that sustained him in camp permeate Margolin's activity in writing after his return to Mandate Palestine in 1946. Counter to the currents in Tel Aviv at the time, he dedicated himself to exposing the truth about the so Soviet camps. He traveled to India, Paris, Germany, and the UN to do so. And in coordination with others, he fought for the right of Soviet Jews to emigrate. Margolin's friend, Roman Gould, the editor of the New York Russian language journal, Novi Journal, described him as someone who, quote, always walked alone with no desire to sing in tune with anyone else. This trait lies behind his break with the right-wing Herut party of Menachem Begin in the 1960s. In several publicistic articles, he elucidates why, in his opinion, the party is not faithful to Jabotinsky's ideals. He faults it for failing to be universalist in scope, focusing only on the local Israeli political scene. Unlike Begin, he favored accepting reparations from Germany, and he contended that it was important to align with the West to bring defeated Germany into the Western fold while pursuing the goal of defeating the totalitarian Soviet Union. It is fitting, I think, to sum up this exceptional personality in his own words. In the face of all his uprootings and tribulations, he reaffirms in that key to his uh, biography that the most central value for him is, quote, the idea of freedom. He, Margolin, relies on the personal effort of the spirit, on inner independence, and on the inalienable rights of man, end quote. Thank you. Stephanie, thank you so much uh, for uh, presenting uh, not only the gist of the story that holds the narrative together, but also it, you know, your, your empathy, your identification uh, with Margolin certainly came through so clearly in, in your words. And uh, so again, thank you very much. Um, and we will, uh, I've been getting a, quite a number of questions from people in the chat uh, while you've been talking. And some of them I'm sure we'll have a chance to get to 
uh, at the end. Uh, one or two of them I've managed to uh, answer along the way. Uh, but uh, again, I'd like to uh, leave some of that for uh, after the panel has finished. And let me please invite uh, at this point, uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Leona Tokker uh, to uh, uh, address us. Thank you, Leona. Thank you. I'm going to talk about the uh, literary merit of this book. I agree with Professor Capel that it is one of the best written narratives of, of Gulag experience. Literary scholars have a problem discussing the artistic merits of a narrative that deals with enormous human suffering and injustice. Those are the big things that the narrative talks about and you want to talk about its, its form, so to say. But this approach is uh, also problematic because the literary power and merit of the narrative enhances its effect as testimony. And if we think about this book being written in 1946-47, the times were very unfavorable for the publication and the dis dissemination of Gulag narratives. The Soviet Union had just won the war against the Germans. Many people didn't want to hear or to allow to be said anything wrong about it. So one of the uh, first people who recognized the value of this uh, book was actually a fine writer, Nina Berberova, uh, who translated it in, into French with another person. Of course, uh, the uh, Art of the narrative enhances the power of testimony. This is what I want to um, stress. How does it do so? When we talk about literary art, we do not have to talk about fiction. Factography, testimony can also be uh, produce a work of art. When uh, the English poet William Wordsworth was walking in the cemeteries and reading epitaphs, he wondered why some of them written by totally ordinary people produce a huge impression, have extraordinary aesthetic merit. And his conclusion was that at the basis of this effect is the congruence between the content and the stance. In Margolin's case, it is particularly obvious. The content is his testimony and his protest against the injustice and the suffering. Uh, and the stance is appropriate to uh, that content. Now, he did not, very many of the people who have been in the Gulag waited for many years before they wrote their books. If we think about Begin's White Nights, he also had a rather short stint in the Gulag. He wrote it in the mid fifties, actually. Margolin turned to uh, testimony as soon as he was able to do so, as soon as he returned to Tel Aviv, he wrote his memoir. So all the memories were very fresh. Uh, there was no memory fatigue there. And uh, at the same time, he also relived every episode which he dealt with. And as it is, uh, as it very often happens with Gulag memoirs, they are divided into parts according to the geographical locations. Like those, those are the stages that the author went through. They are centered on the specific suffering in a specific location. But another progression is uh, the gradual, what, what Stephanie um, talked about the, the dehumanization, the gradual shedding of different aspects of one's 
identity. And his identity is a Russian intellectual and a Jewish. And he begins to shed, especially the Jewish part of it, as he sheds the flesh on his bones, the fats, the flesh, uh, he comes to a point where he is uh, similar to what in Auschwitz is known as the Muslim manner, totally uh, depleted people who seem to have no wish to live, but he shows us that there is a wish to live and there is uh, inner life, even in that kind of a state. Now, that state is very often irreversible. In his case, it was reversed. And here we have another problem. He was a student of philosophy, not just Heidegger, but also Kant. And he saw that in the camps, one cannot live by Kant's categorical imperative. One cannot behave in such a way that as if one wanted everybody to, to behave according to the same maxim. So that uh, the scant amount of food that a doctor could bring him in a totally supererogatory way, uh, the doctor had to decide whether to give it to him or to the patient who was next to him because to divide it would be, would be the death of both. And he chose Margolin, which may suggest to us that even in that kind of a state of total depletion, he had been able to maintain some of his charisma, some of his identity, and make it understood that people are waiting for him back at home, that he has still got a great deal to say. His stance uh, for most of the narrative is that of a Russian diaspora intellectual, a Russian Jewish diaspora intellectual, of course. But this is a very peculiar position because most Gulag memoirs are written by people who have been born in the Soviet Union and for whom what the regime was doing was no big surprise. They grew up with all the um, cognitive dissonance and all the absurdities of the regime. There were also very many foreigners. And now there are Gulag memoirs in in every which language, in, in, in French, in English, in Italian, uh, in Finnish, very many foreigners were, were there. Now, the foreigners had a very big difficulty understanding what was going on. And part of it was, of course, the language problem. So here we have a person who has no language problem, who understands what is being said, what he is being told, but he cannot understand the logic behind it because he is a liberal, because he is uh, used to legality and justice. Everything that is being done to him and to the people around him strikes him as totally absurd, even though, uh, as I said before, there's no linguistic problem. That is why uh, the title of the book, Journey into the Land of the Zex, should remind us of Gulliver's Travels, Journey into the Land of L Lilliput, journey, journey into the Land of Brobdingnag. Again, the gullible Gulliver uh, lands on a strange shore, can communicate with its inhabitants without any linguistic problem, but is faced with uh, impossible absurdities in the social structure and in the moors. So uh, Margolin finds himself in this position and he compares himself to a bespectacled lamb in his naivete and in his attempt to ma maintain his integrity. Now, uh, 
one of the things that make a memoir credible is a, a touch of self-criticism. We usually uh, feel a little bit cautious and skeptical about memoirs where the speaker is representing himself as always right, always uh, honest, always brave and, uh, and, and always kind. Okay, Margolin does not slip into this. And in this chapter on dehumanization, he shows that um, every character has to deteriorate, deteriorate under circumstances like this. One of the uh, early and most important contributions that he makes to the testimony about what it was like to be in the camps is what he calls camp neurosis. And uh, the rather recent publication of the book called The Hunger Disease, written by the doctors of the Warsaw Ghetto, confirms that uh, hunger protracted starvation is not a way of, you know, aesthetic loss of weight. It's a disease and it entails all kinds of things, including psychosis, neurosis, uh, irritability, belligerence, truculence at a certain stage, at a certain other stage, inability to express emotions facially. That is not uh, reflected in the book. This is a little bit of a detour on my part, but when we think that the Muslimen or the, what in Russian is called the Dachadzyagi do not have an inner life, do not have emotions, we should recollect what the uh, doctors of the Warsaw Ghetto say, that they have emotions, but they are unable to give expression to these emotions by in their face, no, no facial expression. Okay, so camp neurosis. Margolin's own neurosis was the wish to um, warm up his food on the stove, the food that he got from the camps. And he admits that this was also somewhat absurd because the energy spent on the fight to have a piece of the stove available for warming the food was not compensated by the added calories when the food was warmed. But there was some kind of a symbolism in it not accepting the food as from the nourishing parents, reprocessing it, taking it over. It was a spiritual rather than a physical need, but it uh, placed him into a kind of a position which is mainly, mainly perhaps less dignified than otherwise. Uh, one of the things that makes this book a very good read. Of course, in, in reading all such memoirs, what keeps us in suspense is the question how they survived, what helped them survive. Because the default case was to gradually lose all one's strengths and, and die because the energy exp expended on work was not compensated by the food. So something had to happen in order to drag people out of it. And he shows the things that did happen. So uh, there is this constant tension between the constant threat of uh, rolling towards uh, death of starvation and reprieves and setbacks on the uh, on the part of the camp in other words the the little victories that he wins that allow him to survive and those are the reprieves those are also the things that make the reading more possible more attractive it's not all the, a collection of horrors 
there are horrors, but then there is also some rest and we can breathe. There is no terrible escalation of cruelties. And therefore, when the cruelties come, we respond to them, we react to them. We never get inured to the injustices against which he protests. Now, the very fact that he was writing when the camps were still in existence. When you think about uh, memoirs of Nazi camps, they were all written when those camps were already dismantled. Some of them turned into museums. Margolin is writing when the camps still exist. And if we read what Navalny writes from his imprisonment right now, and how surprised he is that uh, in less than 100 miles from Moscow, there is a real concentration camp. Well, surprise, surprise. Uh, Margolin is writing when the camps still exist, and that is what fuels his indignation. Unlike other people who were lucky enough to survive to get release, he never produces the impression that that's it. He is out and the camps don't exist. They do exist. And he does not let us forget it. A lot of his narrative is told in the present tense. These things are happening right now. To a certain extent, that also reduces the amount of specific testimony because it is not clear whether he calls the people by their real names. He has to protect them. He maybe has to protect their families. Um, he also wants to protect their privacy. If we think about Primo Levi, he also changed the names of his Auschwitz fellow prisoners when he, when he described them and possibly changed also some of the details that they should not be so easily identifiable. But nevertheless, there are uh, interesting points of testimony, though not about the particular people, rather about tendencies. Uh, and I want to mention one that we do not find in other uh, memoirs. He tells about a, a secret police operative who is sent to interview the ultra-Orthodox Polish Jews in the camp and why they don't want to work on Saturdays and things like that. So this man studies them and, and probably writes a report. Now, this is very similar to an episode in the memoir of the Polish artist Joseph Chapsky about uh, his fellow officers killed in, in Katyn. Also, uh, a secret police operative was sent to interview them to probe their ideology, to probe what they're, they were up to. And that one probably wrote a report that these people are hopeless, incurable. And this is what may have led to the massacre. In uh, Margolin's camp, the report must have been milder. And so these people were not executed. Well, they were just left to, to die at their own uh, speed, so to say, because that's, that was uh, the uh, default case. To return to the uh, artistic merit of the memoir, of course, uh, the non-triviality of thinking, the excellent style, uh, they all contribute to that, but they also contribute to the fact that even though historical circumstances prevented the publication and the dissemination of this book for long periods of time, it is mainly the artistic merit that leads to its revival, to a certain kind of remediation the book returning to 
to, to consciousness and uh, returning to its own consciousness raising function. First, by the work of Luba Jurgenson, who found the parts of that book that were not included in the first French edition and in the first Russian edition in 52. Uh, her translation of that book in, the in full into French. Then our own Edith Sheked translated the whole book into Hebrew, published by Carmel several years later. And now we have an English translation. The book is being remediated. It's returning to public consciousness and given another chance of affecting public opinion. And as we hear from uh, Mr. Navalny, for instance, right now, and as we very faintly hear from North Korea, the subject is still extremely relevant. Thank you. Leona, thank you so much uh, for those very perceptive and very eloquent remarks. Um, I'm grateful uh, to the uh, panelists for what they've told us. I'm mostly grateful uh, for the book for, uh, I had not encountered it before. And um, I am grateful for having had the experience of reading it. Um, Leona, one of the questions that has come up uh, from uh, around the group uh, from Victor Levy is a question that I, I have a feeling that I, I ought to address to you, if you don't mind. Um, and he would, uh, he's interested in uh, knowing whether uh, one could make a a comparison, or how would you put Margolin into a into a comparative or contextual um, uh, relationship with uh, uh, Shalamov and uh, Grossman? Okay, that's that's an interesting question. Um, Shalamov did not write a, a memoir. Um, later on, he, he wrote more or less uh, autobiographical summaries, but he wrote um, short stories. They are fictionalized, but this is the kind of fictionalization that does not reduce their testimonial value because uh, he fictionalized in order to bring up to um, uh, to emphasize recurrent features, serial crimes of the regime. I think that Shalamov would have liked Margolin if he had read them, because in many, uh, if in many ways they saw things in a very similar way, but they wrote in, in, in different genres. Uh, Margolin, without any claims to um, Shalamov did have claims to be writing new prose, new literary prose. Margolin, Margolin's main claim was consciousness raising, but as it happens, he did it very well. With Grossman, I have a, a, a little bit of a problem. Uh, far be it, be it for me to say that people who have not been in the camps need not write about them. I, I never say that. But if you take life and fate, the episodes set in the camps are the weakest in that book. Um, another uh, important thing connecting Margolin and Shalamov, they both belong to the group of writers who, when they start writing, feel that they are the first. They are not aware of writing into any context and they are not aware of each other, so to say. Very many of the later writers already know that things have written before them and they, they feel a kind of a belatedness and they have to deal with it. Shalamov and uh, Margolin do not have that uh, break 
on their wheels, this, this sense of belatedness. They are therefore in, in many ways more spontaneous, though in his later years, Shalamov was already, uh, when he was writing his first stories, he had the sense of being a total pioneer, not so when he was writing his later ones. Great, thank you, Leona. Um, there is a question uh, addressed to uh, Stephanie uh, from James uh, Kleeman. Um, Stephanie, if you wouldn't mind uh, answering, what was the biggest challenge you faced in translating the book? Well, I think in any translation, it's very important to preserve the voice of the special. original while making it read uh, the language you're reading it in. In other words, you don't want to be feeling like you're reading Russian while you're reading English. Um, and I think that's always a challenge in translation. And I think Margolin was very sensitive to language. So we have a mixture on the one hand, he's describing camp and common people and common events and in work events and so on. Uh, I certainly wasn't familiar with some of the terms describing tree felling and things like that <laughs> and potting, <laughs> but altogether preserving the voice while making it resound in the language you're reading for a person who had a fine ear for language as, as Margolin did. Great, thank you. Um, we do have a, a bit of time if there are other questions around the group, if you want to write in the chat or raise your hand so that I can see uh, who would like to speak. Uh, Judith Kornblatt, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, I just did. Um, okay. Actually, I have two questions. One is for Stephanie and one is for Leona. Um, well, maybe Stephanie can also address that one. Stephanie's question is, how did you, um, how did you come about to um, find this, this uh, manuscript or this book um, to translate? And I was also, I guess I'll say to you too, and maybe Leona can answer later. Um, Leona mentioned that he sort of was, he, he didn't have predecessors in his writing of this um, memoir. Um, did he have somewhere behind him 19th century um, precedents that he was thinking of um, when he wrote his, his testimony? So I'll, I'll mute myself now. All right, so perhaps Stephanie first and then Leona, if you also have something to... Yeah, well, um, the, as, I, as I said at the beginning, um, I first encountered Margolin in the early 1970s uh, when I was reading a in, collect Russian. in Russian, a collection, various Soviet gulag memoirs. And I just was very impressed by that book. It, it left an impression, we're talking about the 70s and then we're, we're skip ahead to 2000 and something. And I discovered that the book was translated into Hebrew. Um, and, and I remembered it very clearly and I, went to a uh, book presentation for the, the Hebrew edition, which again, my, uh, the person who helped me so much, Misha Shauli, he was behind the Hebrew edition. And I went to the book presentation and I sat next to Leona. <laughs> and I mentioned to Leona, what a wonderful book this is and how I would love to translate it. <laughs> and Leona, who of course is, very talented in all her ways and, and so knowing about uh, gulag literature said, well, you know, maybe we should try this and this publisher. And uh, that's how we started. And then later I went to, they, Misha also was behind the full Russian edition in Israel. Um, and they had a presentation for Russian readers of the Russian book which I also attended. And then I met Misha and I said, gee, I'd love to translate this book into English. 
So between the two of them, <laughs> that's how it got underway. Um, and uh, and I was also introduced, of course, to uh, not personally, but to Ephraim Margolin, who Misha told me very much wanted to have the book in English. Um, I, I I just want to mention in terms of, I don't know whether, uh, well, yes, I mean, uh, obviously he had certain um, literary uh, precursors, shall we say, as, as I said, he mentioned um, Dostoevsky, which he rather treated a little sarcastically. I mean, there's a prison description of life in prison, which he, he thought, as I said, was kind of like a country club. But he was a person who, as his friends noted, uh, not only was well-educated in Russian culture, he read Tuvin, the Polish uh, poet in Polish. He read Verlaine in French. He read Rilke in German. Uh, he read Yiddish. He read Hebrew. So I think we can assume uh, that, he, and he, he must have known Greek too, because he recognized the Iliad when he heard the Ukrainian uh, reciting it uh, in Greek. So I think we can assume that he had certain prison members, literary precedents that he was familiar with, yeah. uh, you know, as narratively. Leona? Because there were um, a, many memoirs of uh, Russian revolutionaries of the Tsarist times. Vera Figner comes to mind and uh, several others, but they influenced Shalamov much more than Margolin. He was probably, the, they, they hardly formed a part of his reading. Um, how they influenced Shalamov negatively. He, he saw that their values are collapsing in the Gulag and nothing that they teach in these memoirs works in, in the present conditions. So um, the, he didn't have many uh, recursors in terms of the genre. Maybe he worked towards uh, producing the genre of Gulag memoir as a pioneer. He had, now, of course, even before the war in the, in the 30s, there were uh, several narratives, not several, uh, more than 30 narratives of the Gulag by people who had escaped. Probably uh, he had not read them because of his socialist sympathies about which he speaks. They were also not very well known uh, during the war, um, when uh, a, a number of Polish ex-prisoners amnestied could leave the Soviet Union with Anders's army, many of them, women in particular, also wrote memoirs and they were published in England in English translation. For instance, there's a book called The Other Side of the Moon, Polish Memoirs that managed to be anti-Semitic while they are writing about the Gulag too. Okay, but it seems to me that he was not aware of any of these, that he was working without a model, without a genre model. And that's an achievement. Indeed. Um, we'll have one last question, uh, Edward, uh, uh, Weisband um, is curious, and this is open to anyone, of the, anyone on the panel or indeed anyone in the, the audience who may happen to know. Uh, the question is uh, the, about the reception of the book in Russia. Now, I do know from having read the introduction that earlier versions uh, were circulated as Sanizdat. Um, but I suppose Edward's question is broader and would apply as well to, um, uh, to the post-Soviet years and whether uh, there is some sort of a Rezeptionsgeschichte, um, uh, how, how does the book play uh, a, among uh, the Russian reading audiences uh, of our day? Anybody? 
I have one, one little thing to say about that, and then I'd like other people to say. Um, that is, uh, one of the uh, scholars here who also is dealing with Margolin's works is Vladimir Khazan, uh, who was working with Misha on putting uh, together a collection in Russian of, of, um, of Margolin's other writings. And he noted that uh, in the, I'm not sure, 80, 90s, when uh, some of the earlier emigres um, either passed away and their libraries were, were dismantled, uh, there were many copies of uh, Margolin's book in Russian, in Russian in, among these books. So it, it obviously at least made its way uh, in the 70s after the, the, the Chekhov you know, abridged version to in some form uh, to Russians who then came to Israel. Now somebody else can answer about in Russia. <laughs> Maybe Misha or? Yes, Misha. You have to unmute Misha. Mm -hmm. Oh, now it's good. No, we still can't hear you, I'm afraid. No, this is when he speaks, it'll come up. If he speaks. Can you hear me now? Oh, now we can hear you. Excellent. Oh, thank you. Uh, there was no comprehensive study of how Margolin is accepted in uh, Russia today. I have just uh, looked through some internet uh, chats and the uh, Russian people, I'm, I mean Russian people, not Jewish people, Russian people who read uh, the copy, the pirated copies of uh, the latest edition have written that uh, he's better than Solzhenitsyn. Well, it's not, uh, it's not a competition, but that's what they think about it. The prominent uh, Russian authors, uh, and that was his first, um, Viktor Suvorov, to whom I've sent the book, he, he said that it is the best, the best, and he quoted it in, in his works. In Israel, uh, I was uh, a latecomer to Margolin, but uh, I was surprised to see how many Russian speakers in Israel uh, have read his book and love this book. And actually they have pushed me uh, to publish it, to edit and publish and compose it to the full uh, Russian edition. That's okay. it, but no, uh, unfortunately no comprehensive study. I think uh, Hazan will do it. He's a scholar, I'm not. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to uh, leave a, a, a few moments to give the final word uh, to Ephraim Argolin, uh, if you would like to uh, say a few words to us. But you'll have to un you'll have to unmute yourself, Ephraim. Can you hear me now? Yes, very good. Uh, I simply wanted to talk about my father uh, as somebody who saved my life. In uh, 1936, he sent my mother and me to Israel. I didn't want to go. I came to Israel. I became an Israeli. Somehow, World War II went by with me in Israel, fighting the British more than I fought. The Germans, because there were no Germans around to fight. And living without my father. My father was to come to Israel in 1939, and two days before 
he embarked to come, the Nazis entered Poland. He escaped, he ended up in Pinsk with his parents, he was arrested. And then eight years later, uh, he was back. My mother fought to re, to get him back the visa he had originally and missed by two days. The British took a year to do that. Then my father came, we met him in Haifa. I was, I looked at this man with white hair, with half his teeth gone. That was my father. It took some time to get back and to have a relation again with my father. I am very grateful to those who helped publishing his book. I thought it needed publishing. I thought that not many people would be interested in doing that. But surprisingly, they were. Some of them you heard today. It is an amazing thing how a philosopher who almost lost his life, who is writing about the life in a gulag and writing at the time when we in the West considered the Soviet Union the great ally in fighting the German. It was the wrong time. It was the wrong way to talk. It was difficult to find people who will understand my father. But now it is 50 years after he died. And in Israel, there is an incredible group of people who still remember him. And his books are beginning to once again generate interest in what really happened in our lives. Um, I find it difficult explaining it to my children and my grandchildren are too young to understand. But thank you very much for having this symposium about my father. He uh, didn't have it in his life, but he had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who would come and talk about his book and about Siberia and come in speaking almost the language which was theirs and nobody else's. I'm very grateful to you. Thank you, Ephraim, uh, for your very deeply moving personal remarks. I think that is a perfect note on which uh, we should end. Let me say one last a word of thanks uh, to the panelists who spoke to us uh, this evening, to Deborah, Stephanie, and Leona. And of course, uh, a great thanks to the Nevslin Center uh, for research on Russian and East European jury, uh, which in fact uh, made this meeting possible and has sponsored it. So thank you one and all for attending. Uh, please, uh, those of you who have not yet bought and read the book, you simply must do so. <laughs> and uh, have a good night. Bye-bye. <laughs>